Welcome to the afternoon session. So it's a pleasure to introduce Lionel Nelson, uh, Twista SQL model for Plimansky generating functions and gravity scattering. So uh, please, Lionel. Well, I, I'd like to very much thank the organizers, Pavel and Omid and so on, for all the hard work they put to, put in to try to fly me over to um, uh, Poland and everything. And um, I'm so sorry that I failed them by um, uh, testing positive at the last moment before flying. Uh, but I guess you're all grateful that I'm not there to spread around the Delta variant um, uh, uh, in, in the Missourian Lake. So, uh, 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 you know, the systems are at least as functioning, at least as far as that goes. Now, I'm slightly sort of concerned with this lecture that, that, that I'm talking about a bunch of ideas which are maybe a little bit off the mainstream of the um, uh, uh, sort of the audience there. and. Um, so I hope you'll feel able to uh, ask lots of questions and stop me when I'm becoming obscure or assuming that you know about various things that um, are just not common knowledge. But it is, nevertheless, nevertheless I'm feeling quite sort of uh, 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 as if this topic's appropriate for uh, um, the Polish community with um, uh, uh, everything resty on Plebanski in two different ways and, and also some Przynowski and so on. So, Okay, so, 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 so what's the general topic? Uh, so, so, so I'm talking about uh, concepts that go back more than 50, uh, well, nearly 50 years. Um, uh, and so uh, I, I'm going to be talking to a large extent about Pabansky generating functions. And, and these are functions on hyperkähler manifolds. Uh, so th these are 4K dimensional manifolds with um, uh, reduced holonomy. Uh, you know, they're sort of, uh, in general, they're Romanian manifolds and they have reduced holonomy with uh, um, SP, SPK. Um, and uh, um, uh, I'll focus on the Polanski generating function of the first kind, although the ideas apply equally to uh, both kinds. And uh, or, although the ideas apply to full hyperkähler manifolds, uh, I'm going to be focused on the four dimensional case. Uh, because I'm also going to try and sort of um, uh, 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 relate to Einstein gravity. But in fact, uh, uh, one of the things that, that excited me about this topic was its connections to other hot topics in um, uh, algebraic geometry. Um, uh, so, so, so I guess um, uh, uh, I saw some beautiful talks um, uh, just after Christmas uh, 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 by Tom Bridgeland on how it is that uh, Pabansky gener generating functions are now the, the definitive way of understanding uh, the, the generating functions for BPS, uh, um, sorry, well, for gromov witten invariants and donaldson thomas invariants in algebraic geometry or BPS invariants if you're uh, somebody who's interested in supersymmetric gauge theories. Uh, uh, that those actually are Babansky generating functions of the second kind. And that, as I say, some of the ideas here will apply to that as well. But in fact, my motivation came from a different end uh, of uh, mathematical physics altogether. Uh, I've been studying structures in scattering amplitudes for the last 15 years or so, ever since Witten's Twister String. And um, uh, for, for me, Witten's Twister String was a... Um, uh, a revelation because it, it, it gave a breakthrough in how it is that twister ideas could, could um, extend away from the uh, self dual sector, away from the sort of hyperkähler type case to full, full theories. Um, so it goes back again to the 70s, the idea that some um, uh, um, hyperkähler manifolds can be encoded into a deformed twister space. And um, uh, the, the basic thing that I want to, uh, uh, well, so, 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 so if you want to actually uh, um, study a hyperkähler manifold in terms of its twister space, the twister space is um, a, a complex manifold of 2K plus one dimensions. And uh, the twister theory realizes the um, hyperkähler space as a moduli space of holomorphic curves in this twister space. And uh, uh, the key new idea that I'm going to describe in this talk is, is that the um, uh, Kobansky generating functions play uh, a special role uh, in, in this theory. 
as providing the on-shell action uh, of the holomorphic curves. And so, so I'm, I'm going to introduce a sigma model, um, uh, which is a, a model, a, a theory of maps from Riemann spheres into twister space. And uh, uh, what we want to see is that the, um, uh, these um, Pabansky generating functions are um, telling you what the action is of those curves. And this ties in nicely actually to papers that, um, well, I, I know I wrote some and I think others wrote some uh, uh, sort of many years ago in which we sort of had geometrical interpretations of these uh, Pabansky generating, uh, Pabansky functions as generating functions for um, uh, various canonical transformations between coordinate, coordinates on hyperkähler spaces with respect to the various different symplectic forms that they have. And uh, uh, so, so, you know, what is a generating function? Well, often the generating function is the action of something. It's, uh, um, you know, it's the action uh, um, the, 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 of, of, of some associated some Lagrangian. And so this um, sigma model then is, is the theory or the Lagrangian whose um, action gives rise to the Babansky generating functions. Um, for me, I was led into this uh, by studies of scattering amplitudes. And, um, uh, and what this does is, it, is that it sort of uh, explains various weird formally the some um, uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, proper physicists have um, come up with for scattering amplitudes for just ordinary regular uh, four-dimensional Einstein gravity. And uh, uh, what we'll see is that in fact, these, these actions, these signal model actions, uh, actually control the gravity um, S matrix. So um, just, just to be a bit more sort of detailed about uh, uh, some of this prehistory that I'm referring to, I've got a slide just describing how, uh, what gravity scattering amplitudes look like. Um, so, uh, so, so if you want to write down a scattering amplitude, what you do is you imagine that you're, um, uh, you've got these n particles that are scattering and uh, each of them has a momentum. So, so here I've written down a momentum ki uh, and, and what I've uh, done is I've put sort of, um, uh, two component spinner indices of it. So, so of course, a momentum is usually just a, a, a four vector. Uh, but of course, um, uh, for um, a scattering amplitude, uh, that this has to be satisfying the um, uh, field equations, and so it's a null four vector. So it's ECI k dot x is what is is what a plane wave looks like, and and this k. Uh, uh, so, so, but I've introduced spinner indices. So in four dimensions, the um, uh, vector index, I, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this later, uh, can be expressed as a, um, a tensor product of a dotted and an undotted spinner index with alpha ranging over norse and one and alpha dot ranging over norse and one. So you can see that two by two is four, so that's four components. And the special property of being null is that it factorizes into uh, two two component spinners. So the determinant gives you the metrics essentially. So then that vanishes for um, the null vector. And so when you write down an amplitude, uh, what you imagine is that, that you have N of these momenta and the amplitude is made out of invariance of these momenta. And in fact, the polarizations give you a preferred scaling for each of these um, uh, spinner constituents. So although in principle, you could scale kappa up and kappa dot down, um, here, here, in fact, uh, you, you, you imagine that you know, know them absolutely. And then the, um, uh, uh, as, as a notation, we, we have angle brackets being um, uh, the inner product of a pair of um, undotted spinners and square brackets, dotted spinners, and so on and so on. And, um, uh, uh, and, 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 and sorry. So you, you're working in Lorentzian signature. It's not something more fancy like split signature. Um, that's right. So there should be a complex conjugus over this kappa, uh, I realize here. So, uh, uh, and so I apologize for missing that complex conjugation. That should be there. Okay. And, um, uh, and, and so if you have 
uh, the, the, the first non-trivial gravity amplitude actually has two uh, negative velocity particles and n minus two positive velocity. And, and uh, this formula has been known since um, the um, uh, uh, 80s. And um, in 2008, in a paper with David Skinner, we sort of found a slightly simpler version, but it's essentially their formula from BGK from the 80s, where, where you get this long, complicated expression. I mean, it's sort of quite nicely structured, and we were quite pleased with it at the time. Uh, but but, um, uh, uh, but, but, but uh, the, the, the formula that we had then was blown out of the water by a formula that um, uh, Andrew Hodges, uh, uh, a twister theorist in Oxford, came up with in 2012. Which I said, oh no, this is, you don't need to sum over all these, uh, you know, n minus three factorial permutations and whatnot. Um, you can get it just as a determinant of um, a, a matrix. And um, in fact, this prime means it's a reduced determinant. The matrix you write down here happens to have um, uh, 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 a known kernel. Uh, you, you can see that it's, it's degenerate, but you knock out a row and a column and you can write down in what you invariantly mean by a reduced determinant. And um, uh, the, um, so, so, so this big, big complicated formula uh, about nine years ago was reduced to this beautifully simple form, a, 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 a reduced determinant uh, of a matrix here, which is just very simple with these entries given by the, um, uh, just by ratios of these, dotted and the undotted spinner contractions. And uh, the, the diagonal entries are simply lined up to make sure that the sums of the rows and columns vanish. And that's why the, the, the thing has a, um, uh, ha has a um, kernel. The, uh, um, anyway, so th this actually is part of a standard theory in, in combinatorics. In combinatorics, such matrices um, whose rows and columns add up to zero, um, uh, arise as uh, Laplace matrices uh, um, for what's known as the matrix tree theorem. And I haven't actually written out what the trees look like, but the matrix tree theorem um, uh, started life as a way of counting the number of tree diagrams. But you can decorate your trees with um, uh, uh, sort of propagator factors. And if, if this uh, so, so, so if this ij, square bracket ij of angle bracket ij uh, is regarded as uh, something associated to an edge joining two nodes, i and j, so that's a propagator factor, uh, this reduced determinant can be seen to actually add up all the tree diagrams uh, uh, for some uh, Feynman diagram-like theory. And this was something that was identified by physicists back in the 90s, uh, rediscovered by another bunch of people, um, oops, sorry, uh, 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 11 years ago. Okay, so, 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 so part of the point of this talk was to sort of really understand the origin of this. It's, it's, it sounds like there's a theory here that this diagram is expanding that looks nothing like the standard space-time theory. This is not what a space-time uh, propagator would look like in a Feynman diagram. Okay, so, um, uh, uh, so, so, so it, it, what I want to do in this then, it, it, this talk, is to, um, uh, I, I've got another half an hour, haven't I? So I, 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 I'll probably get, get through items one, two, and three on this list. So I want to describe how it is that um, if you want to generate gravity MHV amplitudes, then you need a Lebansky scalar. So that's the first part. Uh, and then the second part is to just describe uh, how the twister space uh, fits into the story uh, for the nonlinear graviton. And the third is to show how um, this twister signal model uh, um, uh, gives rise not just to the Bansky scalar, but it has gives rise to a tree expansion that gives, gives you an understanding of that formula. So that's the main aim for this. And I'll, I'll Maybe he had to skip over the last couple of parts, but we'll see how the time goes. Okay, any, any questions? Okay, so, so to start off with then, um, uh, I want to start with the Blavansky gravity action. 
And uh, um, so, so this goes back to the 70s. I, I don't have a reference there. Uh, uh, but but uh, I should also reference um, a couple of other authors who proposed using that Babanthi action to expand around the self-dual sector of gravity. And it's maybe at that point that one starts to sort of think about what reality conditions you might be proposing and so on. But when one's working perturbatively, the reality conditions don't play a big role. So uh, using the kind of um, uh, uh, a, a tetrad uh, T, X, Y, Z, you can reformulate. So, 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 so we get, we're working on a um, space time M4 with metric. And we imagine that we have an orthonormal frame T, X, Y, Z of one forms. And then we can sort of convert that into equivalently into a, a, a spinner indexed tetrad, which I'm going to call E alpha alpha dot. And this is just a standard transcription. And uh, what Pabansky did back in the 70s was to show that you could reformulate the um, Einstein Hilbert action uh, uh, in terms of just the um, anti self dual spin connection. So this gamma alpha, alpha, alpha beta is, is the anti self dual spin connection. And um, uh, uh, so, so the way that you do it is, is that you um, uh, introduce um, the anti self dual two forms. So these are sort of uh, uh, obtained by contracting on the alpha dot index, these, 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 this, these basis forms here. And we will have three of them. And, um, and, and then what he observed was that the scalar curvature arises if you take the, so, so this here is, is obviously, apart from this fac factor of kappa squared, which is the coupling constant that I've been used to sort of rescale the spin connection, uh, this here is obviously just the anti self dual curvature of the space time. And the anti self dual curvature has two parts it has a Val tensor and Ricci, well, three parts, Val, Ricci, and scalar. And, uh, um, but this contraction kills the, the Val tensor and the trace B Ricci and only leaves you with the scalar. And um, uh, uh, if you just use a kind of um, a restricted Palatini uh, variation, uh, you, 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 can, you can see that varying gamma, you get this equation here, which is what tells you that um, uh, uh, kappa squared times gamma is the um, anti-self dual spin connection. And then you get this equation here uh, that um, uh, uh, tells when you vary um, sigma, uh, that tells you that the uh, curvature has only viral parts. That is to say the Ricci tensor is zero. So this is an observation of uh, uh, Pavansky from the 70s. Um, and so this gives you, with, with this extra, putting the coupling constant kappa squared here, uh, uh, in, uh, to re rescaling the um, uh, uh, re re rescaling the spin connection uh, allows you to um, uh, expand around the self dual sector because if you put kappa equal to zero, then you get this simple action here, and then when you vary gamma, you get that d sigma equals zero, and people who are familiar with hyperkähler manifolds will recognize this as the kind of Gindikin formulation of the hyperkähler equations. That's, uh, uh, that you have three uh, closed two forms essentially, and the sigmas have to satisfy the right algebraic properties um, to, to, to be uh, anti-self-dual two forms. So the, um, if the three anti-self-dual two forms, if there's a spin frame in which they're all closed, then you're, you are in fact hyperkähler and that, that spin connection is flat. And, uh, and uh, gamma still lives in this framework. Ga ga gamma um, uh, uh, is, is not zero. And uh, the field equation there is simply that gamma is a uh, linearized, it's a potential for a linearized anti self dual Val spinner on this self dual background. Um, so, okay. So, so, how does this relate to amplitudes? If you want to expand around the self dual sector, First of, uh, first of all, you have to know that the plus and the minus uh, helicity, the self-dual and the anti-self-dual parts, are kind of conically conjugate. And so, so, so um, 
the only way you can get an all plus amplitude is if a, uh, is if a self dual uh, uh, linear field turns into an anti self dual linear field as it crosses a self dual uh, background. Well, that would only be possible if the self dual sector wasn't consistent. So the all plus amplitude vanishes. Uh, now, the way you can get a one minus amplitude is if you take a self dual, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you take a self dual particle on the background and it scatters. So, if it does something non trivial as it crosses that background, then you can register it by measuring it against the minus particle at, uh, at the other end. So, so, the fact that the one minus and rest plus amplitude vanishes. Is, is, is um, a statement of integrability of the self dual sector, that there is no scattering of self dual fields across space time. And so it turns out, uh, so, so these results in amplitude theory are usually regarded as a consequence of supersymmetry. And the fact that the tree level theory doesn't know whether it's part of the supersymmetric theory or not. Um, Anyway, so the first interesting amplitude is, is, is the so-called uh, MHV interaction, which is a case where there's two uh, anti-self-dual particles. And um, uh, so the two anti-self-dual particles, uh, then uh, you see that, that, uh, uh, that the amplitude is then essentially generated by, by this expression here. This is the um, extra bit in the action that, that we throw away with kappa squared. And um, uh, it, it's quadratic in, in the anti self dual fields. And um, uh, so, so, so the way you think about this is that gamma one and gamma two here are two linear fields propagating on a self dual background. And this sigma represents a fully non linear self dual background. So, uh, so, so, so this is the. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the first interesting amplitude in, in gravity. And uh, it's the probability of, of um, uh, a negative helicity particle flipping into a positive helicity particle as it crosses the self dual background. And um, so, so, so that's what we're going to be interested in for the major uh, uh, majority of this talk. Okay, any, any questions? Okay. Um, now, I, I, I was studying this from this point of view sort of more than 10 years ago with David Skinner. And uh, uh, we use that generating function. So uh, we, we, we imagine that we are plugging in um, uh, a plane wave for each of these gamma one, gamma two self dual, anti self dual particles on the background. And uh, because this is uh, um, the connection, there's a little bit of gauge freedom left in the way you put it in. So these this B in these kappas could be thought of as being um, uh, constant spinners, uh, but the, uh, uh, the the choice of this B here is 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 um, uh, is, is is gauge. And um, but uh, uh, what we noticed recently was that we could um, eliminate the gauge freedom by going to uh, going to a Blavatsky formalism. So given the um, these choice of two two spinners kappa, uh, we can introduce um, uh, a spin frame aligned along kappa one and kappa two. And this gives us complex coordinates on the space time. And I use complex in a kind of slightly loose sense that uh, this is the point at which I start to become a little bit uh, complacent as to whether we're working in Lorentz signature, split signature or whatever, or, or just a bit more generally in the complex. So, so I'm going to call the coordinates z alpha dot and z tilde alpha dot. If we were in the red signature, of course, one each of these would be real. And uh, uh, with that, uh, you see, we, we, we still got a, 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 a self dual background. And so our anti self dual two forms uh, are closed. And um, uh, uh, so, so following Pabansky again in a different, um, uh, different set of his ideas, we can um, choose our um, uh, uh, basis of um, uh, anti self dual two forms so, su such as uh, sigma one one is d two z sigma two two is d two z tilde and then sigma one two well it's closed and so on but it's now going to be non trivial because it's a general self dual background 
and uh, uh, but it has to be uh, dz times dz tilde, and it has to be Kähler. So you you discover that there's a Kähler scalar omega, and it satisfies the Mondrian pair equation. So so, so this is um, so you can do this, and then if you take our form here that was generating the MHV amplitude, you can sort of see, roughly speaking, that it's actually not going to be hard to sort of take dd tilde of omega here. So, so, so the sigma 1, 1 and sigma 2, 2 just cancel away. But the sig sigma 1, 2 here, you can integrate by parts. And you end up with this simple formula here for the um, uh, generating function. And this was actually a big improvement over what David Skinner and I had sort of 10, 12 years ago, because that, that we no longer have these uh, gauge dependent Bs in, in, the, in, in the formula. So now what I want to do is to explain how we can generate this from twisted space, but uh, any questions? I mean, what's kind of intriguing here though, so we're now thinking about this omega though as part of full Einstein gravity. Uh, albeit in this kind of restricted sector. Okay, so the nonlinear graviton. So, um, uh, so, so, so what is twister space? Well, let's just say for the moment it's, it's CP3 or CP3 without, uh, uh, um, you take away a line and uh, uh, we have homogeneous coordinates, lambda and mu. Uh, with the same kind of, uh, these are the spinner, standard four dimensional spinner indices. And um, uh, so, so again, going back, uh, 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 you know, ne nearly half a century, um, we, we have this statement, the deformations of the complex structure on this BT prime uh, uh, correspond to self-dual deformations of the conformal structure on, um, uh, uh, on space time. And, um, the main ideas here, the, um, well, the way I'm going to talk about it is that I'm going to deform the D-bar operator on the twister space. And um, uh, uh, what happens is that the, um, uh, the uh, you, you see, the way in which you reconstruct space-time from the twister space is that it's a space of uh, uh, holomorphically embedded Riemann spheres in the twister space. And according to Kadara, those Riemann spheres will survive deformation and they will still be in a four-dimensional family. So you can define space-time in that way, and you can define a conformal structure because X and Y will be connected by a light ray if and only if the two corresponding um, curves in twister space intersect. And it's guaranteed uh, that the uh, anti self dual vial tensor will vanish. So, so this is very much like the uh, structures that uh, I think I think uh, Boris was telling us about this morning. Uh, and um, uh, for Einstein, uh, we need a bit more data. We have to have a holomorphic Poisson structure uh, 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 on on the twister space, which is going to be a, a bi vector of weight minus two. Um, and um, uh, uh, and if you have this. Then, that, then uh, that we can also say that the Ricci tensor is pure cosmological constant. And in fact, um, uh, uh, if you work in the uh, simplest case, so, so, so here you see we can write the Poisson structure in terms of, um, so, so if you introduce a twister index i, which is the four components index, then we can introduce the uh, uh, Poisson structure then as a bivector. Uh, and this holomorphic bi vector on, on the twister space. So um, this um, will be um, uh, rank four for Cassonian Kähler, uh, uh, but just rank two for Hyperkähler. So for Hyperkähler, this will just be d by d mu times wedge d by d mu, whereas for Cassonian Kähler, it will have a component in the lambda direct direction as well. And so I developed a formalism for describing this in a Dolbo framework. Uh, with Martin Wolf um, uh, uh, 12 years ago. And uh, so, so uh, in, in that formalism, you, you can say that d bar of um, uh, uh, the deformed d bar of some uh, function f uh, was a finite deformation of the, um, 
a flat D bar operator, uh, you know, so here we're thinking of lambda mu as holomorphic coordinates. So this would just be D lambda bar times D lambda bar and so on and so on. Uh, and, and so, so, so it's corrected by this uh, Hamiltonian deformation. This H is a naught one form uh, um, uh, uh, with homogeneity degree two to compensate for the, the, the negative homogeneity of the bus and structure. And then the integrability of um, this uh, um, uh, uh, almost complex structure is given by this kind of churn Simons like, uh, um, well, sorry, it's just a flatness like condition here. And in fact, what we did was we introduced a churn term Simons like Lagrangian for, for, for the, these sorts of uh, definitions. Anyway, I don't need to go there. Um, and then, if you want to describe what holomorphic curves are, then then that then they're given by um, uh, 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 maps from a Riemann sphere into the twister space, such that d bar on the Riemann sphere is given by this expression. And uh, obviously, this would be zero in the flat case, and d bar would be, you know, be holomorphic. Uh, but but in the general case, you have to solve this uh, d bar equation, and this is. Uh, has all the nice existence theorems of holomorphic curves in complex manifolds. And the Kadara theory tells you that these things will exist in uh, all good circumstances. Being a physicist, I'm not gonna tell you what precisely good means. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm really a physicist, but anyway, uh, being lazy. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so, so in the hypercalar case, then we're just going to have that this uh, bus on by vector is given by d by d mu, d by d mu. And um, uh, uh, so, so, so that means that the lambda coordinates are holomorphic. And so you have this vibration onto the Riemann sphere. And uh, uh, we can simplify a little bit by, um, uh, 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 but by using lambda as the coordinates on the uh, Riemann spheres in question. So this is our holomorphic curve equation uh, um, that, that we need to um, uh, satisfy. And in fact, we're, we're interested in specializing to the Babansky framework. So, so we've got these special coordinates Z and Z tilde, and we want to adapt our coordinates to, to those, uh, to, to those um, our curves to those coordinates. And so, so we can do that by saying that um, uh, Z occurs when lambda one equals zero, and z tilde is the value of f when uh, 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 lambda two equals zero. So, uh, so, so these are in some sense the freely specifiable coordinates that will define the curve. And once we specify those coordinates, we expect there to be a unique curve through um, uh, uh, with, with the, those leading order terms at lambda one and lambda two. And so. Uh, uh, so, so, so we need to focus on the difference then, this m, to get an nice elliptic problem, uh, which will um, uh, have no, you know, which will have a uniquely determined solution. So, so, so at this point now, m has homogeneity degree uh, minus one on the Riemann surface. The f was a homogeneous coordinate of degree plus one, so the lambda one, lambda two takes it down to minus one, and. Uh, um, the equation that M satisfies is d lambda bar of M is equal to this here. And at this point, we can quite easily see that this is uh, uh, given by an action, which is <coughs> a first order action, which um, uh, uh, has kinetic term M d bar M. So this square bracket is just the epsilon, dotted epsilon. It's the same square bracket as I introduced at the beginning for contraction of um, dotted uh, Lorentz spinners, and um, uh, and then you can see that when you vary m, you'll get the derivative of h with respect to m, and you'll get this equation. So the um, uh, uh, so so the key proposition then um, is is that um, uh, this is first of all uh, 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 an action for holomorphic curves. And secondly, that the Verbansky scalar is the value of that on-shell action. Now, I'm not going to give you a full-blown proof of that here and now, uh, uh, but in fact, it's not very hard, and it's in our paper. Um, and, and the way it uh, um, 
operates is, is via, um, you, you just differentiate this with respect to Z and Z tilde, and you can differentiate under the integral sign here, and um, uh, assuming that everything is on shell, you discover that, um, that the uh, integral localizes uh, lambda one equals zero, lambda two equals zero, and, and that uh, um, uh, at that point, you can read off the derivative of omega, uh, the derivative of the Bansky scalar. So it's not a very hard computation. Okay, so, um, uh, so, so, so with that then, we can take our um, MHV generating function to be this integral now uh, that I had before, but I've replaced the, where I had the Blavatsky scalar before, we now have this um, uh, on-shell action. And uh, I'll, I'll take out this inner product of kappa one, kappa two, because there are various factors that come out of the measure because kappa one and kappa two are quite the, um, uh, uh, well, anyway, they, uh, they, 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 uh, uh, they, they, they weren't necessarily normalized. Uh, but I use them as, spin, as a spin frame. And um, then we can, um, uh, 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 we, we can actually ask how to expand um, this on-shell action. And this is something which goes back to elementary quantum field theory, but because it's, we're, we're interested in, in expanding this in such a way that we're just getting the classical on-shell value of this action on a perturbative solution to the field equations, uh, we end up using tree diagrams. And there's a standard way of doing this whereby uh, you, you imagine that H is um, a, a linear combination of sort of n minus two um, uh, plane waves, for example, and the plane waves, uh, you can easily write down the formula that plane waves actually have this nice delta function representation. So that uh, whenever you do an integral of them, you, 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 you look the, the integral immediately localizes against the delta function. And um, the, uh, um, uh, and, and, and so what you do is you, you, you uh, these V's are basically the term in the action that corresponds to each of these HI's and we ignore any HI squared. And so, so the on-shell action is to, to this order, to n minus two -th order, given by uh, um, a correlation function of, of n minus two of these V's. And the correlation function is obtained by just forming connected tree diagrams where the, um, uh, propagators are given by the, um, uh, uh, the the kinetic term of the action uh, S up there. And the kinetic term of the action essentially just simply implements the Poisson brackets on the two H's. And it also has a one over angle brackets IJ as being the, um, the Cauchy kernel for the D bar operator on the Riemann sphere. So, um, so, so this gives you this simple sort of propagator factor times the H's, uh, which is the, uh, uh, which going back to the early slide is precisely the, um, uh, uh, the, the propagator that appeared in the tree diagram formalism that the physicists had discovered in the 90s. So, um, uh, so, 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 uh, We can, we can resum those tree diagrams then using the matrix tree theorem as this reduced determinant um, uh, that, um, uh, uh, that, that, that Andrew Hodges discovered just by fiddling with formulae really. And um, uh, you know, sort of proved with uh, using just an analysticity properties of the S matrix. So the, um, uh, uh, okay, so, so, so this gives you the sum of tree diagrams the, and, and this is the propagator that comes out of our twisted signal model. And um, uh, the diagonal entries of the matrix is just part of the yoga of uh, a Laplace matrix for summing tree diagrams. It's the sum of the propagators. Um, it, yeah, it's in, well, it's determined by vanishing rows. Anyway, so integrating out the uh, uh, various variables then lands us on Hodge, Hodge's formula. So, um, uh, uh, so, 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 so that was a, um, 
uh, uh, the first main aim. Okay, <clears throat> so there are various questions you now might want to ask. Uh, uh, so, so you might say, well, that was the MHV sector of gravity. You, you only had two negative velocity particles. Very nice, but can you do more? Sorry, I should have just asked whether there are any questions at this point. No. Okay, uh, so so you might have said, well, that was just the MHV sector. Can, can, can we can we have uh, more negative velocity particles? Uh, and the other uh, question is, you know, can, can we have a cosmological constant? Um, and um, well, uh, the answer to all of these things uh, is yes. I mean, a, neg a cosmological constant here, in the language of hypercalar geometry, is just the uh, the transition from hyperkähler to quaternion kähler geometry. Uh, so, so in some sense, in the world of integral systems or a world of sort of holonomy reduction, uh, uh, that's a sort of a well-known generalization uh, already studied by Simon Salomon back in the um, uh, um, uh, beginning of the eighties. Anyway, so, uh, so, 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 so if you want to have more negative velocity particles, then um, here uh, I'm, I'm just pulling out of a hat that it turns out that if you want to have negative velocity particles on twister space, they correspond to cohomology classes of degree minus six, uh, so, sorry, weight minus six, the uh, H1s for, for weight minus six. Um, and so what you might imagine is that you, well, we're gonna to need to have K of these if you want to have, um, you know, two goes up to k now, and we'll have to insert them at k different points um, in twister space. Uh, but we are, we're also talking about rational curves in twister space, so we'll have to uh, uh, think about where, where those points... So what I'm trying to do here in this formula is I'm trying to find a map from um, a, a Riemann sphere into twister space so that at the point sigma r uh, on the Riemann sphere, that's landing at the point zr in twister space. So the way I'm doing it is I'm putting a pole in uh, sigma, uh, sigma equals sigma r with residue zr, and then saying that there's some finite remainder. Now, because these are, are all in some sense homogeneous coordinates, uh, uh, it doesn't need to be a pole, you can multiply the whole thing through by a product of the sigma minus sigma r's, and then you would have that the rest of it all vanishes at sigma r except for zr. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say that I can find a, um, a, a, a unique curve um, uh, through um, k points in twister space. Uh, and um, the, um, uh, I, and, and the way you do this is basically just by going up in degree. I mean, so, so the point is that uh, in, the, I'm, in, in the Penrose correspondence, we were only ever looking at sort of curves of degree one, but now we're gonna look at curves of um, uh, d degree uh, K minus one uh, in order to get uh, the curve to go through K different points in twister space. Uh, given by these ZRs. And I can write down uh, a, a sigma model, uh, much as I did before. In fact, it looks slightly neater because, um, uh, 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 because now there's none of these funny factors in the denominator that I had before. And um, uh, so, so my claim is that this is a sigma model in twister space uh, that gives rise to um, uh, 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 gives rise to these degree d k minus one curves through these points that are. And the on shell action will then define now um, uh, a function of k points on twister space and k points on the Riemann sphere. And at this point, I, I, I suddenly panic because I look at the clock and my, my chairman tells me now that I've run out of time. Is that true? So, sorry, you're muted. No, no you, have, you have you have a, a bit more minutes. I, I, how, many, how many minutes do I have? Sorry. Uh, 
I think you have three minutes. I have three minutes. Okay, uh, I'll, 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 try and, I'll try and keep it to at least less than five or something. Uh, okay, so, 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 so what I've done here is, I, I, is very much in the same spirit as what I had before. I've now got a Polvansky scalar. Uh, you see, the sigma r's didn't play a role before because we just talked about two points in the ring sphere. And even for three points, that, that there'd be no moduli there. But in general, we, uh, we've got k points in twister space and, and um, uh, uh, k points on the Riemann sphere. And so what can you do with this? Well, first of all, let's just, uh, uh, I, here I was working with um, cosmological constants. So let, let's just go back to the case of two points in the Riemann sphere. Then what I have is, is a function of Z1 and Z2 on what's now for a quaternionic Kähler twister space. And um, so in Euclidean um, signature, this, uh, 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 th 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 this twister space can be identified with what's sometimes known as a swan bundle, or at least a non-projected non twister space. It's a total space of the spin bundle. And that's sometimes known as a swan bundle up to Z2 uh, over the quaternion Kähler manifold. And what Swan did was he defined a hyperkähler structure on, on this total space. And so I claim that this omega Z1, Z2, well, if, if Z2 is a Euclidean conjugate of Z1, it is the Kähler scalar on the twister space uh, on, on the Swan, um, uh, for, for the Swan hyperkähler structure on the twister space. And, um, uh, and that gives you uh, a hyperkähler structure on the Swiss space in the standard complex structure of the Swiss space. Uh, this is also, if you just, uh, th th this is also the Prznowski scalar uh, in the sense that um, uh, uh, Prznowski actually defined the Prznowski scalar on a quaternion Kähler uh, four manifolds. Uh, and so you, you can uh, uh, choose a, um, a holomorphic surface in this twister space identify that with the, um, uh, the, the original quaternion Kähler manifold, and then this omega restricts to be the Brzezinowski scalar. And so, um, uh, so, so, so this, this gives you a representation of the Brzezinowski scalar. So, uh, so, so, so that's the K equals two case. I won't go through the details of this formula, but this, this generalized Babansky function can now be used as a generating function for the full tree level S matrix for general relativity. So now we've got an unrestricted number of uh, anti self dual particles on the, on the background. And uh, the only thing that I don't have time to explain is an extra kind of fudge factor that we need in the formula, another depth prime uh, of, uh, it looks very similar to the sort of thing we had before uh, the, uh, of this matrix H tilde. And if you throw that in, we can get a full formula for the full gravity tree level S matrix for all K. And this has a number of checks, uh, but, uh, and, uh, but, but because I'm out of time, I, I had better uh, just conclude. Um, so, uh, okay, so, 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 so what have I said? I, I said that the Einstein well, maybe I should just go back and say that uh, this, our, our formula here is, is still uh, a little bit conjectural. I mean, there's, quite, there's a certain amount of evidence. Uh, um, at, at zero cosmological constant, this is proved. Uh, but uh, for non-zero cosmological constants, its status still has some um, uh, uh, conjectural aspects. Um, okay. The, uh, so, so, so what we've seen then is that the Einstein gravity tree level amplitudes are generated by the on-shell action of this signal model for curves in twister space. And the number of anti-self-dual particles goes up with the degree, but we can still do it somehow on, on a self-dual background. Uh, with, with, uh, I mean, it's, it's somehow perturbative in the anti-self-dual particles. Um, uh, what I think is very unusual in the subject is to have a direct sort of connection with the einstein hilbert action. Uh, this is only the case at degree one. At a higher degree, I wouldn't know how to connect those um, uh, generalized Babansky generating functions to, to, to the einstein hilbert action. 
we can reformulate these ideas at null infinity. This H here ends up being the integral of the asymptotic shear. And, um, uh, and, and so we get an amusing picture whereby um, uh, uh, we, we can, for people who are familiar with Newman's H space, um, he, he had a good cut as being these, uh, so uh, uh, giving rise to um, points in a self-dual background for the self-dual part of the asymptotic data. And here, what we can see is that um, uh, uh, these higher degree curves that then look like they're trying to give you a uh, rational approximation to the true light cone cuts. The um, uh, uh, completely fanciful idea, maybe we can quantize this sigma model, you know, we get some weird formula and who knows what that means. Um, uh, uh, there's still a degree of incompleteness in terms of reformulating Einstein gravity in twister space. We had to, uh, we had this extra fudge fact, which I didn't really explain very much. So it was inserted by hand because we knew it had to be there. Um, and there's also, uh, so I have a, a, a super strong research student at the moment who just came up with a twister action for gravity. So, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, I have some vague hopes that this could connect directly to that too. Um, okay, so thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you for bearing with me. Cheers. Okay, thank you, Lionel. Uh, questions, please. So the Penrose diagram you had two slides uh, before. Uh, so for which uh, space times actually these pictures? So yeah, I mean, I guess I, I I guess I was really just trying to say that um, yeah. So 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 here you see you, you have to sort of think about what you even mean by scattering on um, when you have cosmological constant. And um, so in fact, um, the sort of formula that this gives rise to is not the sort of thing that people do in cosmology. So if you're asymptotically dissociated, you see, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. So so in the asymptotically flat case. What you imagine that you're doing is that you, you, you pose data on scry minus and you're sort of asking how does it scatter through the scry plus. But in quantum field theory, it's a bit more complicated because you're asking about fields which are positive frequency on scry plus, negative frequency on scry minus or something. But anyway, there's some similar story. Uh, um, and on the sitter space, you, you could actually follow that same strategy. You could think of scry minus and scry plus, you Pose data on scry minus, you evolve it through the scry plus, so you could ask about that scattering. That's not actually what cosmologists do. Cosmologists only ever look at correlation functions at late time. So what we're computing with this case of a cosmological constant does not compare well with uh, uh, what other people in the physics community uh, uh, think of as the interesting calculations to do in a cosmological space time, because basically, you, you know, that there is no scry minus. Uh, but mathematically, I think this is a fair representation of what we think we're doing with, with the cosmological constant. Other questions? Okay, if there's no questions, so let's thank Lionel again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lionel.